That's because I got a, wow. Yeah, that's the difference. That's because I got a big mouth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, let me start that over. Hey, let me tell you, thank you for, for filling out that blue Connect card. It helps us to connect with you. So we do really, really appreciate it, okay? Um, one of the things on there is that you can share prayer requests. I promise you, we pray about those prayer requests. We pray over those prayer requests. If you're on the email, you often get, like every week, uh, an email from Cole where he prays over your specific requests. So they're prayed over. Share with us those things. They're important. They're important to us, and they're important to God. So let's keep doing that, okay? All right. Um, the next slide is that we also can give, and we can, you can do that on electronic. Uh, the electronic thing, help me, QR code, thank you. Stop. Okay, God, you got this. Okay, on the back of your chair is a QR code. There's a, there's a paper there that has three QR codes. One of them will take you to the Connect card. That's the blue one. The black one will take you to our website where you can find out all the things CCNAT. You can find out anything that we're doing. You can find out who we are. You can find out all kinds of things on our webpage. And the last one there, the green one, is our giving slide. So you can go there and connect and give to the church, which, by the way, I don't know if you realize this. I don't know if I say this enough. You're not really giving to the church. You're giving to God. Amen. You're giving to God. God has commissioned his church to be his hands and feet in the, in the world, and that's what we are. So when you give to God through your church, the church then blesses everyone around it if it can, right? So that's how you do that. You're welcome to do that. There's also blessing boxes in the back. We do not pass a plate here. We have blessing boxes in the back that you can drop your money if you want to share that way. You can also go online and do that, okay? All right. Um, we are having, we are not having a simple cooking for healthier meals with Chef Dave this week, okay? So I asked them to put that slide on there so that you, I would remember to tell you, but normally that would be tomorrow night. Instead of coming here to learn to cook, here's what I'd like you to do. Take some time between, I think it's normally at 7 o'clock, right? 6 o'clock. Between 6 and 8, take some time, get alone, and pray for Chef Dave. Okay? That's what I want you to do. During that time, take some time and make it a point to pray for Chef Dave. Okay? That's simple. He's going to have a procedure done next week. We just want to pray for him. We want to lift him up. And that's why we're not having a class. Okay? Good reason. Okay. There's also, this is a reminder, next Saturday... At 1 o'clock, right here in this sanctuary, we are going to be celebrating the life of Arnie Selfers. We all miss him, the great man who blessed us in so many ways and called us back to things that we needed to be aware of, right? Um, so we're going to be here next week, next Saturday, in this sanctuary to celebrate his life together with his family. Please come and show your support, okay? And then... Um, we are doing what we're calling a Mission in the Round. Mission in the Round is on April 30th, and it is right here again in this sanctuary. We will be not really dismissing our lift groups. We are asking all of our lift groups to come here. We're going to come here. We're going to hear from, uh, I just forgot Micheline's last name. Somebody tell me. Larrabee, that's it. Is Micheline here? Somewhere? Ah, there she is. I see her. I know where she sits, but she's sitting back out and see her. Anyway, she's going to be sharing with us some of her adventures, and I'm sure that this is going to be really great because I've heard some of these already. And it's just going to be a good time together here next Sunday night on April 30th. Um, everybody here, 6 o'clock in this room, okay? You all good with that? It's going to be good. Barb's pointing at something. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Sign up. That's it. See, I shouldn't do announcements. <laughs> sign, sign up in the foyer so that Mary can make sure that she has enough of everything that she needs, okay? So please 
today, sign up in the foyer to come out here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock and be a part of that service. All right? No lift groups. It's going to be a good day. Lift groups are here. Yes. There are lift groups. There are lift groups are here. Everybody's here. Lift groups, right? All of you that are in lift groups, you're going to be here, right? Right. And all of you that are not in lift groups, you're going to be here, right? Right. Right. It's just everybody together enjoying a time hearing about Micheline's mission work and some things that are happening, probably things that are still happening because of that work. It's going to be a good time. All right. At this time, I'm going to get out of the way. Let's enjoy some worship. Lord, thank you so much for bringing me into your house this morning. It's so great to be in the house of the Lord with my bad brothers and sisters. Lord, I've heard so many times where a lot of people, we talk about how this is our practice for when we're in heaven, for when we get to see you face to face, Lord. Lord, and you've come to show me that's not even exactly true, that I'm already there. You've shown me that the greatest part of heaven is your presence and the presence of your people, and I've got that today. And if I just open my eyes, I'm already in heaven, and I'm already in the house of the Lord. There are things that are painful and that still hurt me in my life around me that you're going to take care of those things, but I'm already there, Lord. This isn't a warm-up. This is game day. This isn't a practice session. And I thank you so much for bringing me already today into the house of the Lord. And as we sing about your house this morning, I just ask you to open our eyes to see we are already in our eternal life with you. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. Beggar. 
prisoners. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, put your hands up. In the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet.
the here and now by love and faith let the church live loud our god will say we believe we believe and the gates of hell will not prevail for the power of god has torn the veil We 
pour out our praise. We pour out our praise at your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. take a deep breath. Now you're at a place to praise him. Let's together enter into his presence. Let's enter into his presence in praise. Oh, Father, you're the one that gives us that breath, Lord. That breath that breathes life, your life into each one of us, Lord. We don't need to have a special place of posture for that to happen. That posture is in our hearts, Lord. As we breathe and as we feel, feel your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and our lives, Lord, we just begin to celebrate and it begins to well up from the very bottoms of our feet to the tops and out the top to overflowing, Lord. We are so thankful today that as you work in and through us, Lord, as we sing praises to you, Lord, that we can do it individually and we can do it corporately. And you get all glory for it, Lord. Thank you for the freedom that you bring with every breath, Lord, that we breathe. With every breath that enters our lungs and into our life, Lord, it is life-giving freedom that you bring with it, Lord. That is where we celebrate today. So help us, Lord, as we open our hearts and our lives to know you better, to know you more, to listen more closely, to have that intimate relationship with you that you so desire for us, Lord, that there's nothing rote or ritualistic about it, but that it is freedom in your Holy Spirit that we experience new and fresh every time, Lord, every time. Help us not to just wait until we come together. Help us to celebrate how we can be with you constantly and continually, Lord, to lift our praises, but also to lift our petitions before you, Lord. You know our needs. You know our real needs. You know deep within our heart what it is that we need to for you to do in and through us. And even in there, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for knowing us so wonderfully, Lord. Knowing us from the very beginning and knowing who we are, who we've been created to be, to serve you and to love you. So Lord, today, that's where we come to you. We come to you raw and ready to allow you to do a fresh work in us. Lord, help us to prepare our hearts and our minds before you. Help us to keep them open. Help us to keep them receptive to allow you to speak to us today, just as you've already been speaking today, Lord. We thank you that you will continue to speak, and you will continue to touch, and you will continue to do the work that you first started and that you will see to completion, Lord, as we trust in you, as we lean on you, as we, we rely on you, as we live in you and through you. Lord, you are great, and your grace never ceases to amaze us, Lord. So we stand amazed in your presence. And Lord, right now, we know we have several among us. We've already prayed for one today, but Lord, we're coming to you right now for Sassar, Lord. We just pray that as we anoint him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, that you continue to do that here. 
healing work in him, Lord. That you would be with him in these, these surgeries and these procedures and everything that's ahead of him, Lord. That he would know your presence so strongly that he would know he's not going alone. And Lord, we know that you'll go with him and we thank you for that. But we know that his family needs strength, Lord. And so we pray for them as well. Lord, that, that you would do that work that they need to be those caregivers, Lord. That they would have your power and your strength. And Lord, that this would be a mighty opportunity to show yourself among so many people that will be involved in his care. And so we give you, Sasar, right now, trusting what you're doing is perfect and right and glorious, Lord. We give you praise and we allow you Give us reasons to praise you and to celebrate you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I would be, you may be seated. I would be amiss if I didn't stand up and testify this morning. The Holy Spirit has been so close to me. And as many of you know, four years ago this week, Art passed away. And I am going to tell you the power of prayer. I prayed for him, and Pastor Wes and Alita will know this, for 18 years. And for many of those years, I came alone to church. And Art was just known as Debbie's husband. And then the Lord started to speak to him through many of you and through a lot of our friends that are not here anymore. But he grew to know the Lord. And I will remember the night that he passed, the praise team joined me as we sang to him, and his favorite song was Victory in Jesus. And, you know, we, we thought he was comatose, but when we sang that song, he lifted his eyebrows, and we knew that he had victory in Jesus. And he's, he's in heaven today. And I would have to say thank you because a lot of my church family prayed with me those many years. Now I have to thank you and praise God because you also have prayed with me for my boys. Artie, Jr., or I should say the third, uh, had an issue with drugs ever since he was 16. He's 42 right now. He just now is clean and sober. And you know what? That is a miracle. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of times people look at the people on the platform or you, you look at the saints of the church and you think, what a perfect life they have. It's not perfect. It's just that we have grown, grown close to the Lord. The Lord has been close to us this morning. I listened to a preacher on TV while I was getting ready, and she was talking about the um, feeding the 5,000. And she said, you know, we think, we think the message is about the 5,000, how blessed they should have been that there was food. But really, it was about the disciples. Because their first reaction was to say, send them away. And I think sometimes I've been guilty of that, and sometimes with my children as they have dealt with this drug issue, I've wanted to send them away. It was too hard. It was too hurtful. But thank God I just stayed and, and worked it out, and I just felt your support, and I just want to praise God this morning. He is so, so awesome. I don't even know what he's going to do tomorrow for me. I don't even know what he's going to do this afternoon, but I want you to know that I love the Lord, and I'm, I am excited for our church. I feel like great things are happening. Just hold on. Get ready, because it's coming. I love you all. Thank you. We got power, power, power to live God's way. Power, power, power to live God's way. That's God's gift to us today. Pow, pow, power to live God's way. We got pow, pow, power to live God's way. Pow, pow, power to live God's way. That's God's gift to us today. Pow, pow, power to live God's way. Praise God. I don't know if you know this.
So I'm going to tell you, you have power to live God's way. You have power to live God's way. You can choose to live a quiet, kind of subdued, in the, in the shadows kind of Christian life. But I want you to know, that's not powerful. Powerful is somebody that speaks the truth. Right? What have we been talking about for the last, I don't know, like eight weeks? We have been talking about speaking Jesus over people. We have been speaking Jesus over people. I speak Jesus over you, Cesar, right now. In the name of Jesus, be healed, brother. Be healed. I speak Jesus over you, brother Dave, right now, because I know he has a work for you. In Jesus' name, be healed. God is speaking. We have power if we choose to live in it. Or we can. My pastor, I've, I've shared with you about my pastor. He had great words. One of his sayings was, you can live a powerful, spirit-filled life, or you can live some namby-pamby kind of life in some dark place hiding, hiding behind it. Right? None of us want to be namby-pamby, whatever that means. I have no idea what that means. I just know he used to use that. Right before he said, or you can climb up some myth tree. Nobody wants to climb up a myth tree. So when Pastor Barb and and Cole showed me this video on we can live in the power by Salty. Salty is the hymn book that was singing to us up there. If you don't remember him, I can tell you that I remember him really well about 40 years ago. (laughs) Right? When my oldest child was listening to him sing praises to God. We get so tied up in styles and sounds and we need to let that go and just praise God wherever we are. I, I, I have been, some of you know this, some of you don't, but we had Easter just a few weeks ago and it was a crazy week going through Holy Week and and getting ready for resurrection. And And I was amazed as I got into Friday because all of a sudden, Holy Spirit said to me, why are you doing so much about resurrection? It's every Sunday we celebrate resurrection. Yes, Easter's a special day, but resurrection today is a celebration of resurrection. Let him know you're excited about it. Yes, sir. Right? Thank you. I was, I, I, went from, I went from Easter Sunday to Trevecca in Nashville, Tennessee with a whole bunch of teenagers to run around, get about four hours of sleep, and be in the sun outside running constant for three days. The good thing is I was blessed. I got to drive almost all the way home too. <laughs> right? That might actually have been a good thing. But point being, right, it was one thing to the next thing. And then this weekend was District Advance. So we have, those of you who went to District Advance, we have been immersed in worship, in hearing messages of challenge. To I actually considered, because I have the DS's um, uh, sermon on video, I honestly considered showing it today. But I did that last year, I think, and, and it, was, it was good. He challenged us. But you know what I love the most about District Advance? All of you who go, you know this. It's really interesting. The general superintendent, the district superintendent, and all those other speakers, they get up and they start challenging us to live. And you know what they challenge us to do? The same thing that your pastors keep challenging you to do. It's confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. We are put here on this earth to worship God, to bring praise to our Lord, and to share the gospel with everybody we can. We are not put here to do, what was the word I just used? Uh, A namby-pamby kind of Christianity, right? We are not put here to sit in the sidelines and pretend like it doesn't matter. We're here to share the gospel that all who will hear can hear 
of life transforming power. Amen. You know what? I'm thinking that I might get into my sermon at some point today, but right now, I want you to understand how important it is that you live in that kind of power. Do we want to take this community for Jesus? Do we want to share Jesus with every person that we can? We can't do it sitting in here. Right? Man, we need to be mobilized. We need to get going. We need to pray our way to heaven and pray others' way into heaven. Right? I heard a story this weekend. It was about four guys who took some other guy who was a, a, a paraplegic, I guess. He was, he, was, he was not able to walk, that's for sure. It seemed like he may not have been able to use his arms. And they took him to see Jesus, but they couldn't get to Jesus, so they ripped off the roof and got him in front of Jesus. Never tells us. It never tells us they were his friend. Right? All they tell us, all it tells us is that he needed Jesus and they took him there. Will you take people to Jesus? I also heard a story about building houses, building relationships, building time together. So we rip the, we whip, we rip the, the roof off of places so that we can get people in front of Jesus. That kind of tells me we do everything we can. And we build relationships, we build houses, we build things that will help us to build character. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. We build things so that we can have a better time to share Jesus, to explain who he is, to build life together. There's power in the name of Jesus. The other thing, and then I'm going to promise I'm going to get into my sermon. The other thing, don't let me see you standing or sitting quietly when we're worshiping. Our children are showing us how to worship. They are showing us how to worship. And I understand everybody doesn't have the same personality, but when the Spirit hits you, let Him know you see Him, you feel Him, and He's there. Sing, dance, I don't care, but praise God with all of your being. If you do that, you'll start to experience some of that power I'm talking about. Just saying. All right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. I just have a short sermon. It's only like four and a half pages. It won't take long. Should be out of here by 1.30, I think. Okay? But I want to start with a quote. And as Pastor Barb was working on slides for my sermon last night, she said, oh, interesting. I want you to know I made this quote last week. (laughs) I said, well, we're going to share this quote again today. Because John Wesley was quoted as saying, God does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. God does nothing except for when we pray. And then he does everything. Everything. And so we here at Spring Hill Calvary Church of the Nazarene, have chosen to follow the denominational request to pray together as we work our way through Pentecost again this year. Now, I would love to tell you we have another big celebration that's going to happen on on Pentecost Sunday. Last year on Pentecost Sunday, we celebrated and burnt our mortgage. You didn't hear me. Last year, on Pentecost Sunday, we celebrated and burnt our mortgage, right? I mean, that means you guys paid off a mortgage that was somewhat astounding just five years earlier, right? I would love to tell you that we have that same kind of celebration coming on Pentecost Sunday. We don't, but you know what we do have? We have a celebration of Holy Spirit power that fell on Pentecost Sunday. And we pray, we, we talk about that as we read the book of Acts every time we read the book of Acts, right? See, this brings this 
feeling of unity when we're all focused and praying together. And the idea of over 500,000 people, that's a half a million, by the way, right? Half million prayer mobilization, you saw that on the slide. Over 500,000 people called to pray in unity as we move from Resurrection Sunday through Pentecost. Together. Together. That's exciting. Can you imagine what God must be thinking as so many people are crying out to him together with the same intentional, intentional prayer? See, when the the first, when this idea first came from the general church, we heard a cry, a cry to mobilize the people to be one in the Lord. That's why this series is called One. One in the Lord. And the desire was to have all Nazarenes working toward one purpose. Now, while I want you to know, I believe that that's a good cry from our general superintendents. And our senior leaders are involved in that, and they're, they're showing that through denominational stuff that they're throwing out to us to use. And I truly believe, truly believe it's an important and good call. But I have one beef. Why do we have to use the word Nazarene instead of believers? I'm a Nazarene through and through. I believe our doctrine. But I believe that all people that believe in Christ can come together and the power increases. Right? We are not limited. The power of Holy Spirit is unlimited if you'll live in it. See, they went on to call us all to become a blessing to our communities as we realize our passion for bringing people to Jesus. That's our passion. Does anybody remember our passion? Sharing Jesus? We did a, we did a study just a few years ago called Sharing Jesus Without Fear. And a whole lot of you took that course. See, The denomination finished their cry with a challenge. They challenged us to seek the transformation of people to become Christ-like disciples. That's what our mission statement or our vision, I never know which one's which, vision or mission statement of the Church of the Nazarene, to see people become Christ-like disciples. And we want to mobilize people to make a holy positive impact on our world. Not just our community, but on our world. When I read that statement coming from our generals, I couldn't help but think it sounded a lot like what we've been saying around here, around this church, for the last, I don't know, six plus years, right? Anybody know that? We exist to see lives transformed, empowered, and forever changed. Some of you are starting to get that. It, that's pretty good. It's only taken six years. We're doing good. And how do we do that? By applying our vision. We do that by applying our vision. We and vision equipped Christ followers serving their neighbors. Would you, can you imagine what would happen if you just, you know, I don't know, You saw your neighbor out working on something, and you just went over and helped them. No, 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 you're not asking for anything. You don't need them to come and help you. You just go and help them. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine if you're driving down the road, and you see somebody in need, and you just stopped and helped them? What? Do you know who you're talking to, Pastor? There's some crazy people in this town. Yes, there are. But there probably would be less if we would love them like Jesus loved them. Look at what 1 Peter 4.10 says. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Why? To serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So we are going to continue praying our way to Pentecost as we look at the unified ways we can work together as one body 
with one vision to serve the one and only God. Sounds like a plan, right? Okay, now think about this. What comes to your mind when somebody says they're going to talk about unity? What comes to your mind when somebody says they're going to talk about unity? Probably some of you think, "Uh uh-oh, who's out of line? Who's not following? What's going on? What's the problem? How many parents or coaches or even pastors have made a plea to a group that they lead to be unified? Hundreds, thousands, probably even more, right? Especially when some conflict seeks to split them apart. Am I right? See, the discussion about unity is often addressed when someone or something threatens to destroy or split a group, either through conflict or some unforeseen problem. This conversation almost never takes place when it should. It should take place outside of the context of conflict. It often comes up as like this last stitch effort or a, a grasp for peace when an issue is completely overshadowed and, and the quality of the relationship is deteriorating, right? That's what we usually talk about, unity. Hey, get it together because everything's going to fall apart. Today, while there is no massive conflict or large group problem that I know of, I want to talk to you about this idea of unity. So, hear this right. I don't know of anything that's about to split us up. I don't know of any problems that are truly coming against us. Do I know there's issues in the church? Well, I'd be lying if I said no to that. There's issues everywhere. There could be no issues in this church. Do you want to see no issues in this church? I'll have everybody stand up. We'll all go out to our cars and we'll leave. There'll be no issues in this church. (laughs) Right? But as long as people are here, there are issues. That doesn't mean there's conflict. That doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means there's people. I was standing at the back on Easter Sunday, and I probably looked really wore out. I was tired. By the way, I've slept just a little bit since then, so I'm pretty tired still. But I was tired, and one of our wonderful supporting saints looked at me and said, Pastor, are you okay? So yeah, just a little bit tired. And they said to me, just remember, Pastor, the more people you have, the more problems you have. So be careful what you pray for. (laughs) Right? I want problems like that. I want problems like that because the more people we have, the more people are hearing the gospel, the more people we're sending out to share the gospel, and the more people hear about Jesus. That's all I'm about, that people hear about Jesus. Let me make one more comment before I jump into this with both feet. It's important to know that we are discussing unity, not uniformity. Two different words. See, we seek oneness in spirit and mind. We do not seek sameness. Unity is more than willing to accept differences while uniformity seeks to eliminate them, right? I have worked for people that tell me, well, you see, we don't, we might have the same vision, but we don't have the same way of getting there. And they've said that was a problem for them. Pastor Barb and I have had multiple really serious conversations, and you know what we want? We want people that are going the same place. Where are we going? To see lives transformed, empowered, and forever changed, right? Every time somebody comes to us and says, I got this idea for a ministry, we say, good. How does it work in being transformed, empowered, and forever changed? That's what we want to know, right? So we want a lot of people that are going there. 
but going in all kinds of different ways to get there. Why? More people will hear the gospel. More people will understand the gospel. More people will be called and drawn to Jesus. I know this is crazy, but I'm not exactly like you. I know, you're all praising, you're, you're all praising God right now. You're like, good, I'm so glad I'm not like him. <laughs> right? That dude is out of his mind. Right? I'm not like you. Not all of you. Not all of you. And some of you have people in your lives that I don't have in my life. Probably all of you. So we need to get more people who are not uniform, but unified to share that gospel. We understand that we are made to be unique. So this uniquely difference between us must be celebrated with the understanding that we can still be unified within our uniqueness. Some of you remember our last district superintendent. He would always say, and I get this mixed up, but he would always say, you are called to be something in your unique world, right? Your unique neighborhood, you are unique in the way you are. I can't say it his way, but it's true. We are all different to do something unique. We all have a purpose, and that purpose should excite us. And when we have that purpose in the Lord, we start to experience Holy Spirit revival in our soul. So, as we wrap our minds around these concepts, we begin to wonder how we're going to achieve unity. See, uniformity is far easier, right? Uniformity is merely a means of power, control, and coercion. Sounds a little bit worldly to me. Maybe like most of our jobs were. Right? Unity requires heart change. Unity is transformation of the mind and loving our enemies. No wonder so many people default to uniformity instead of unity. Right? I caught myself last night. I never made it right. The guys, the people that I said this to are in this room. So here's the thing. I said something last night about going back into managerial mode, becoming a manager again, right? Wrong. You never lead in manager mode. Managers are the ones who are working in power, control, and coercion. You will do it because you work for me. Get that? Anybody had a job like that? Uh Uh-huh. There's very few of you that didn't, because unless you worked for the church all of your life, and you worked for a very spiritual body of believers who were not about making you conform, instead were all about lifting you spiritually, you were with people that tried to coerce you, make you live in uniformity. See, the ways that we can possibly be one, the ways that we could possibly be one does not have to be by us all becoming the same mindset. What if, in the midst of political divides, social divisions, family disputes, and national crises, what if we found a way to, instead of putting each other's down, other down, we began to love and lift people up. I'm going to blow your mind right now. I want you to understand, there are Democrats that are Christians. <laughs> I know, right? All of you Republicans are out there going, what? That guy, get him off the stage. There are Democrats that are diehard, 100% sold out, Followers of Jesus who are living in the Spirit. Quit putting them down. There are Catholics who believe in Jesus 
who are living for Jesus, who are sold out following Jesus. It's not about them becoming like us. It's about us sharing truth. Wow. What if we were all unified under one thought to see lives transformed, empowered, and forever changed? Oh, my. But maybe our problem is that we're not supposed to pursue unity. You might scoff at this idea of thinking that it's not scriptural, but even Jesus prayed in John 17 for all the believers in all future times, which would include us, by the way, in an explicit prayer that all of them may be one. Now, has anybody ever read their Bible and you've read like maybe what Matthew was like and what Peter was like and what James was like and and what Thomas was like? Do you know that they have a little bit of a different spin on the way they lived? Yet they all walked with Jesus personally for three years. Hmm. Jesus definitely values unity and even petitions the Father that we would all be one. But what if the things that's off is not our desire for unity, but our assumption that we're supposed to pursue unity? What if that's what's off? See, the word unity appears seven times in the NIV translation of Scripture. Seven times. Five of them appear in the New Testament. Once... Unity is celebrated in the Old Testament in Psalm 133, 1. (coughs) Excuse me. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Psalm 133, 1. Right? Three times we're asked to put forth effort to keep unity once Three times, let me get that in my head. Three times we're asked to put forth effort, effort to keep unity. We need to keep unity. Three times it says that. Ephesians 4 3, make every effort to keep the unity. 2 Chronicles 30 12, give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered. And John 17, which I just said, right? Verses 22 and 23. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be brought to complete unity. There's another three times that we're told unity is the outcome. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Paul tells us God made known the mystery of Christ to bring unity to all things. And then in chapter 4, verses 12, 13, 12 and 13, he adds to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. These are good scriptures. These are scriptures that you can look up. You can check out, check out Colossians 3.14. We're commanded, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Okay, now I want you to consider this. Once unity is celebrated, three times it takes effort from us, and two of those times it says that God's power is on us, right? Three times we're told that unity is the outcome. It's the outcome. So why would we assume that unity is meant to be the goal that we're striving to reach? We're never told that unity is the goal. Hear that? We're never told that unity is the goal. This should make sense because 
we all know that as soon as we talk about unity, we begin to realize all the ways in which we're not unified, right? Some of you are sitting there thinking, wow, pastor's talking about unity, and I know of this going on and that going on, and, and I don't really want to hang out with that person, right? Amen. Scripture never tells us to pursue, to pursue the goal of unity. Scripture teaches that unity is great, that it won't naturally happen, and that unity is a byproduct, a byproduct of other pursuits. You ever tried really hard? I mean, like, have you ever really tried to eat nothing but healthy food? Some of you have. I would guess 1%, right? Unhealthy food, we're told we should stay away from. I had a really great friend, really great friend. I drove from Ohio to Florida just to be by his bedside when he went into hospice. Really great friend. When he started to have problems, he went to the doctor, and he came back and he told me, he said, Pastor, the doctor has told me a remedy for all of my problems. I said, well, that's awesome. What is it? He said, if it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> I'm like, who wants to live like that? He said, not me. <laughs> right? Right? You ever tried to eat nothing but healthy food? Maybe you swore off desserts or stayed away from eating unhealthy carbs and you added some exercise to your life, right? Right? You started to get healthy. You told yourself that you're not going to eat any sugar. And you're going be, to become the healthiest, healthiest version of you as possible. Now think about this. When you're trying to eat all healthy food, what do you think about? Potato. Cherry pie? Yeah. Potato <laughs> chips? Nacho cheese Doritos and dip? Right? Blizzards from Dairy Queen? Or even better, Papa Clyde's Banana Splits? What? Right? I mean, those things are ridiculous because they're not just great and good and feel and taste good, but you leave there feeling like you're going to throw up because there's so much that you just bloated. Right? I want you to know, every time I get a full card from Papa Clyde's, I indulge. <laughs> I indulge. I'm a bad person when it comes to that. I, I have lived my life believing that there's always room for ice cream. I have. It melts and it just kind of falls in behind and every around, every, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, that's all I think about when I'm trying not to eat that stuff. If you put your focus on not eating unhealthy food, you'll find it increasingly difficult to not eat unhealthy food. However, if you put your focus on eating healthy food, on living healthy, on exercise and sunshine, you'll find that avoiding what you don't want becomes much easier. It truly does. I really like fish and broccoli. What's wrong with that? Nothing. If it's cooked right and it tastes good, I mean, I... That's healthy, right? I still have room for Papa Clyde's afterward. <laughs> when your focus is on the good things that will make your body healthy, you don't realize as much what you are not eating. This is how it is with unity. If we put on our pursuit of unity, we'll find it hard to pursue unity, to find unity, because unity was never meant to be the goal. It's a byproduct. It's an outcome. So what should we pursue if we're going to be people who are one in unity? The answer to that question is the same answer that most of you that grew up in the church have been giving for years. Years. And I know that because I've taught a lot of children 
and a lot of young adults. And when you say something that they're not sure the answer of, the answer is always the same. Jesus! Right? It's Jesus. We pursue Jesus. In Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, we're told, and I have this in here, so I should probably read it out of here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have it in here. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effort when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Under Christ. So as we pursue Christ, we find ourselves unified. This should make the most sense of all of these ideas. If all of us are pursuing Jesus in all the areas that are most important, then we will grow in our similarity. What we value will become more like what Jesus valued. What? If we want to be like Jesus, we will start to value the things that Jesus valued. What we love will begin to look more like what Jesus loved. Do you know what Jesus loved? People. Our mutual pursuit of Jesus will bring us closer to each other. The pursuit of Jesus will also be the great revealer of whether we are becoming more unified or if we're really only seeking Uniformity. One of the things I heard while at one of these places I've been recently was that we have this thing as pastors that we tend to fall into managing the decline of our church. Managing the decline of our church. Can you imagine? I'm going to tell you something. I can't. If I'm ever put in a place where I'm managing the decline of our church, you'll probably get my resignation. I don't do that. I live in building mode. I don't sit still well. You know that? I don't stay calm well. That's probably why God said, okay, I'm going to make you a preacher. Right? I I just don't stop well. When I stop, I sleep. (laughs) Just kind of how it works. Galatians 3.28 tells us, there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus. These distinctions do not go away. It's not just a matter of identity. See, our identity in Christ and our intimacy with Him become way more important than our identity in the world and what other people think of us. And the more that we focus on Jesus, the more we find ourselves thinking alike. What this teaches is that you have more in common with the person who follows Jesus than anyone who doesn't believe in him. You know that? Your fellow believer may be a different generation. They might be in a different tax bracket. They might be of a different political party. They may even like the New York Yankees. I know there's probably at least one of you here. I was a Cleveland Indians fan for a lot of years, and you stopped us from getting where we needed to go way too often. Right? I know, I'm talking to a whole bunch of people from New York. I expect there's at least a New York Yankee here fan fan here, right? 
You can fill that in. Some of you are, are uh, Tampa Bay Devil Rays fans. I don't think they're Devil Rays anymore. I think they're just the Rays. But I don't know who their foe is. I don't know who their, their, the person that knocks them out is. Right now, they're playing great baseball. Right? But you know. I, I'm going to tell you something else. It's hard for me to say. Some of my best friends, they come from that state up north that's the best part of it's underwater, you know, that you, you probably don't know. Um, some of my best friends come from Michigan. It's really hard to say Michigan as a Buckeye. But some of my best friends come from Michigan. And God brought me to Florida to, tell, to show me that. He did. I got a call from a pastor in Michigan when I lived in Ohio before I was ever in paid ministry. He said, I want you to come for an interview. And I said, I can't. He said, why? And I don't even remember what I told him. I'm sure I made something up. But at that point, I was like, I, I can't. Woody Hayes said, buy your gas in Ohio before you cross the line. Right? I was a Buckeye all the way through. Michigan people are pretty great. Absolutely. Some of my best friends. I know them. And I'm excited to know them. Even if there's differences, when you have a pursuit of Jesus, it doesn't matter. That's why I can say, I love Michigan people. I very much do, because I have great friends that are from there. And they probably hate the Buckeyes just about as much as I did hate the Wolverines at that point, right? See, you're more unified with the people that are serving Jesus than you are with the people that are not, even if you're connected to them in some other way. <clears throat> it's not meant that, to say that we have to break ties. I want you to hear that. I'm not saying that you have to break ties with people that are of a different party or a different thought if they don't love Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is to understand the strength of the bond that we have as believers as we focus or pursue more of Jesus. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip his people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. In this passage, we find unity within the works of service that are good works, which God prepared in advance for us. That's Ephesians 2. Unity isn't found in thinking about it or talking about it or even from desiring it. Unity is found by working together in the common things that God has created us to do. Learning to cook better. Learning to be a better mechanic. Learning to read the Bible in a certain or a better way. <clears throat> All of these things are good. The point of the work is to build up the body, to fulfill the Great Commission. It's the, it's the goal, right? The goal that Jesus told us to pursue when we push aside our personal agendas to give ourselves to service of this work, some powerful things happen. Remember how we started this sermon? You can have power. We gain an appreciation of the gifting of others. It's easier in our world today to assume that we don't need people around us, right? Anybody have one of these? Do you know that you can sit across from somebody at a table and text them and you don't have to say a word? <laughs> It happens constantly, right? Happens all the time. We're finding ourselves in this place where we don't really need other people. 
the value of an individual has been lost as we continue to believe that we're fine all by ourselves, on our own. But as we pursue what God has called us to, we realize we cannot accomplish it on our own. We need the gifting of those around us in order to accomplish the goals God's calling us to do. And as we gain an appreciation for the gifting of others, we gain an appreciation for others. Realizing that we are created to need the gifting of others allows us to see the value of an individual. Individual. We used to do this in school. There used to be these things called icebreakers where we would get together and do things with each other just so that we would learn names and have to interact with people. Now it's like, get out your phone. Right? You know I'm right. Valuing others is also the prerequisite for knowing others. So when we value those around us, we grow closer in community to those around us. Serving in this context for the most intimate community is how relationships are built. And relationships form closer when we work together for a common goal. Unity is a natural byproduct of us working together for a goal. I'm going to say it again. Our goal is to see lives transformed, empowered, and forever changed. Forever changed. The last thing that we must pursue for unity to be the outcome is virtue. Virtue. Colossians 12, 14 reads, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. To me, this is saying that it matters how we act. It matters if people see us as loving, caring, and willing to help. It matters that we carry a spirit of inclusion and care rather than that heaviness that stifles the room when we walk in. Ever had that happen? Walk into a place and everybody gets quiet? The idea of Christian living matters because it affects our witness. If people perceive us as anything other than committed to following the teachings of Jesus, who, by the way, went out of his way to heal the sick, raise the dead, and share the love of God, right? Right. Then we are not carrying the spirit of unity or the spirit of togetherness, living as God's chosen people. What are God's chosen people? They're holy. They're dearly loved people. Clothing ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what we're supposed to do. Bearing with each other and forgiving one another, living under the law of love that Jesus so diligently shared. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you living out these virtues? Are you living out these virtues? Because if you're not, it's going to be harder for people to be unified with you because You don't really look like Jesus. I know, that's tough. Sorry. But it's scripture. 
That's why it's important for you and I to pursue compassion. I don't have a lot of that. I have to work at being compassionate, right? Some of you do too, although not most of you, as I can tell. I have to work at being kind. We need humility. We need gentleness. We need patience. Don't do this simply because they're good. Even though they are good, don't do it just because they're good. Do it because it's what Jesus is like. Jesus is full of that. All of that good stuff. But most of all, it says, most of all, put on love. We should pursue love. Love is the only thing that's able to hold each virtue in its perfect balance. Love. Love knows when to hold someone accountable and when to extend mercy. Love knows when to teach and when to forgive. Love knows when to help someone and when to bear with one another. Right? Helping somebody and bearing with one another are not exactly the same. You ever just have to come up next to somebody and be there? Not necessarily do anything, just be there. I had that experience yesterday as well. What I believe you'll find when you pursue Jesus, when you pursue serving, when you pursue pursue virtue, is that unity is the natural byproduct. That's why you're challenged each week with a spiritual next step. Got your blue cards? Uh Uh-oh, mine fell out. On your blue card, it says, my next step. The next step for this week is a call to seek as one, to intentionally seek all Jesus has for us. Intentional. So as the band comes back or the worship team comes back to the stage, remember, unity doesn't come from a focus on unity. It comes as the outcome of when we pursue Jesus, as when we pursue his mission and his character, all together as one. Unity is not the prerequisite for this work. Unity is the outcome. So we don't have anything tearing us apart right now. Let's work together for Jesus. And we won't have anything start to tear us apart. We don't unify so that we can do what we're called to do. As we do the work, we find ourselves unified. And this is a big deal to Jesus. His prayer for all those who will believe in me, he says, is still that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. John 17, 20 through 21. So I ask, Will you do the work that will lead us all living in the spirit of unity? Will you pursue Jesus? Will you pursue his mission? Will you pursue his character? If so, I believe we will find ourselves in the oneness that Jesus spoke about. These altars are here for you. If you feel like you'd like to talk with God, there is not anything magical about kneeling in these benches. Nothing magical happens when you kneel here. But they are a place to seek Him and to talk to Him. If you have questions about His virtues or even who He is, 
If you don't know Jesus, you don't walk with Jesus, these are a great place to come to find answers. His word says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you want or need to find Jesus, he's right here, right now. And you can find him by seeking him with all your heart. Will you come? Stand with me.
start by apologizing. I didn't realize how long I went until I looked at my watch afterward. We need to have one of those timers up there that goes off and says, get out, get out, get out. Sorry. Uh, I try really hard to keep my sermons short, and that was not short. So I apologize for that. But I will tell you this. God has something for us. He is giving us more and more because he knows he wants to work in and through each one of you. So, let me give you a blessing. Hold out your hands and receive this blessing. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the deep, of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.